Hello and welcome to The Journey with me, Fonti. Today I'll be speaking with the CEO of Aphrodite, the makers of Basri skincare products, Jolet. At some point in her life, she told me she never felt beautiful. She thought she was that the most ugly woman in the world. And, some, and somehow she got into, the, you know, into producing the most beautiful skincare products you can ever think of at the moment. This product is so beautiful, it's so good, it's so luxe, and, and I love it. So I want to find out how she made it here. So, Alicia, good morning, good morning. and welcome to uh, The Journey. And can you take me back into when that time you thought you were not beautiful? <laughs> well, I suppose I've always been a bit of a nerd and, you know, not not, not someone who would probably look at beauty products or makeup. I, I've never worn makeup or never really cared too much what my hair looked like. And you know, right through school, it was all about studying and making sure you got the grades and appearance didn't really matter to me. I just thought I'm ugly. No beauty products gonna help me with that. It's not gonna make me feel any more beautiful. And it wasn't until uh, I was probably working in my job as a scientist for just under 10 years and my hair fell out and I, I really felt quite, uh, I didn't feel like a woman anymore, I, you know, all my hair had fallen out of the back, I felt ugly, I, ugly is such a strong word, but I didn't feel like a beautiful person, I didn't feel like it mattered, you know, my hair had fallen out, what was I going to do about it? So I started researching, you know, uh, remedies, things that could help, you know, hopefully make my hair grow back, and I discovered an online community of women, other women like me, who helped support me through that part of my life where I felt incredibly ugly where my hair had fallen out because you know hair loss can have an incredible effect on you it can make you feel less than a woman yeah um, now, let me let me ask you uh, you you've started feeling that you're not uh, beautiful before your hair started falling out isn't it yeah I didn't really care before okay, you didn't care before <laughs> what, what what would you think what do you think made you not to care more about beauty at that point before your hair started falling off I don't know maybe just I just felt I was an ugly person and I had to be smart. What, what was your definition of ugly or beautiful? What, I suppose at the time I would have thought someone was beautiful, had long flowing hair and I, I had quite bad acne at the time. They would have clear skin I suppose that you know didn't have pop marks and freckles like, like I did. And I just thought well I'll be smart. There's no need for me to be beautiful. I'm already smart so I'll just don't worry about that side of my, of my, my appearance doesn't matter, you know, I don't have to be a beautiful person. Then your hair started falling off at, at some I, point. I think for some reason that made me feel even more ugly and mm -hmm. made me want to do something about it. About it was like a, a kick, like I had yeah. to do something about my hair because well, up until that point, even though it wasn't amazing or long, it was still my hair. And What happened to your hair? Why did your hair, do you know what happened to it your was, hair? I, well, I relaxed my hair and then it fell out because of the relax, as it does. It was a, probably a harsh relax. So I did it myself in my bathroom, globbed it on my head, and uh, some of it came out with the relaxer. And then I decided to put a weave on to cover up the ball patch, mm -hmm. and then ripped the weave straight off, and that made the hair, like there was just a ball patch there, nothing in about three points, uh, two at the back and one at the front of my head. And I mean, I'd had hair loss before, but it always grew back, and I was, I think this time I was just worried I'd gone too far. Okay. <laughs> I'd gone to that point where I couldn't repair my yeah, hair. Yeah. So, well, what was the most difficult thing for you at that time when your hair, you know, fell, uh, fell off? I didn't want to leave the house. <laughs> I, I felt so ugly. I just, didn't, I didn't even want to go to work. I, you know, I, I didn't have any hair at the back, and I, I, didn't, I couldn't put the weave back in. I couldn't cover it up. I couldn't relax it. So I just used to go to work with this ball patch, and I, I guess it was just difficult for me to even want to leave the house. I didn't want to go to the shops. And that was when, that was when you got a kick on you to start to start what researching. Doing. What can I do something about this? Is there a way to kind of? grow my hair back and there are times when it isn't possible to necessarily grow it back. I was lucky that my hair wasn't that damaged that you know I couldn't that it was permanently lost mm -hmm. and I found some remedies some Caribbean remedies and African remedies that helped me regrow my hair and I started researching more into that life into that community and was supported by women online who also had had similar problems in the past and I realized it wasn't just my problem this was a community problem that there are you know a whole host of black women out there. When I, the first time I, I, I came in contact with this product, my question was, 
what is the brand behind this? What is this? I haven't seen any African Caribbean products as this, you know, I just fell in love with this product. Then I found out that while I was researching, I found out that the product was actually named after the mom. I said, this woman must be very soft and beautiful. But here she is telling me she never felt beautiful. So I want to know the relationship with her and her mom and this product. Tell me, Alicia. Uh, I, well, I named uh, the Joliet products after my mom Joliet because I respect her more than anything else in the world. She is the strongest person I know. She's incredible. She was a headmistress for 10 years uh, at a boarding school in Jamaica. And she brought the school from, you know, catching water in buckets to having solar panels and uh, internet and computers for every child at the school and I think in a Caribbean school that's a big achievement and not I mean it's not even just doing that she made it a place that young women could grow up and feel empowered I mean she's such an you know she made me feel empowered she made me want to be like her and to have 500 girls also want to be you know, as successful and as empowered as her was, I think, a great achievement, actually. Mm -hmm. Over 500 girls, you know, over a 10-year period, you know, every year there'd be a, a new set of girls, another 100 girls joining. And, um, I mean, they got new dormitories, I think, I think they're named after her. But um, she's so strong and nothing brings her down, you know, she's the happiest person you'll ever meet. I mean, she wakes up in the morning and she goes, good morning, she's one of those people, incredibly happy. And, in, and I just think that even that smile is incredibly powerful. That she would never accept, accept anything less than the best. She would never let anyone speak to her a certain way. And I think we all need to feel that. We need to feel empowered. We need to let our young people know that they should be empowered. That they shouldn't have to take anything from anyone. Not just men, but from other women as well. We can be very severe with each other. I think black women can be incredibly, uh, women generally can be very severe with each other. Mm -hmm. We can try to pull each other down mm -hmm. instead of supporting each other, instead of collaborating with each other. And I think they need to, um, we need to more bring it together, which is what I found with the, 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 the black hair community and with the communities, the natural skin care community, a lot of that camaraderie that I found, I, I appreciated that because it made me think of my mom and how, you know, how hard she tried to get women to feel, you know, empowered. Empowered. Okay, now, your mom, she, she's also, is she also part of the business? Yes, she's my co-partner, but she's more of a silent partner. I mean, I, I knew what I wanted to create, and she supported me in getting that created. So, I guess I'm, I wouldn't say the brains behind it. And I guess she's the heart behind the business. As a teenager, you know, you, your mom can be like your worst enemy. You, you want to get away from them, you know, Tell stopping you doing all the things that you want to do, you know. So as soon as I, you know, as soon as I could, I got all the good grades at school so I could go to... My, I mean, my mother was not just my mother, she was also my head teacher, so at the end of the day when I was going, oh, she was there. I mean, uh, in sixth form, I asked to go to the boarding school and stay, because we, you know, we lived on campus, you know, every day I would go home, my mother would be there, you know, she, she was strict, but she was still a nice person, and, you know, she was different when she was at home to when she was at school, so it was like having two different women in my life, my headmistress and my mother. <laughs> Uh, in six form, I actually had three three women, three, you know, well, you know, <laughs> partner, and a business partner, and a business partner. <laughs> so when in six form, I actually went to board because I wanted to get away from her, and then I got all the good grades so I could go to university and get away from my parents and all the strict things. And while I, I went to Madrid, and while I was there, I actually missed my parents a lot. And uh, it was when I came home back to England that I actually. You know, I actually appreciated her more and it was like, gosh, I, I missed my mom and now we're best friends. I mean, I know that, that that comes with age, but she's my best friend and she's also my business partner. I mean, she's the grandmother to my children, grandmother to my children, obviously she's the grandmother to my children, but, you know, they love her. They call her Mimi, you know, like a kind of a, an African way for saying grandma uh, from, I think, from Ghana, but it's the way that she... She, she has them as like her own children and it's made me even closer to her. So we are very close now and even though, you know, the business is in the middle, we never clash on things. We both want the same thing. Yeah. So I don't think we've really ever argued about the business. We both want it to go the same place. And I think she really appreciated me naming the products after her. I think she was like really touched that I would even think of naming, you know, the products Joliet. What of that? Oh my God, my dad is very important to me as well. I mean, my mom and dad have been married for, oh, 
give away my age now, 30, 34 years, I think they've been married. And that to me is also an inspiration that they've been a couple for that long because it's given me hope for the idea of marriage and for the idea of couples. My dad is a very strong man and my mom is very strong. To have two strong people in our relationship has been the founding of me because they made me feel that anything was possible, especially to have two black parents who, you know, pushed me to make me realize that, you know, being black is, is a good thing. It's, you know, it's, you know, you can be made to feel that you're less than because you're black, but both my black parents pushed me forward and made me realize that they could do anything so I can do anything. And my dad is always pushing me to be the best, to be better than the best. He's always pushing, I mean, I have a son and I'm so happy that he has a role model like my dad in his life. I mean, my daughter is lucky. She has me, she has my mom, she has my aunts. And, you know, my son will have his father and he'll also have my father as role models. And it's important to me that he also has um, my dad as a black role model, as someone that can push him forward. You know, and he's he's great. I love my dad. He's my biggest customer. <laughs> he's always buying my products. My daughter made this. On deciding the price of the products, the Jeanette range, what were the factors that you needed to think about before saying, okay, it's gonna be five pounds, gonna be ten pounds, gonna be what? You know, so uh, we did look at what the what the, the normal industry standard was for regular product, and then looked at what you know in in other other luxury products, what was the kind of maximum that you would pay for products that currently were used by our, our, the people we were marketing to. Um, we, I mean, if you look at most black hair products or even most products on the shelf that, you know, uh, if you go into Sainsbury's or Boots and look at a product on the shelf for hair, they're usually around about five pounds and we wanted something that was a bit more than just normal. I mean, we use the best ingredients, we source the best ingredients and the best the best of everything to go into these products we want the best packaging um, and so to go along with the best packaging we also have to decide that it was going to be a luxury product because it was going to be better than what was normally on the shelf what you could just grab off the shelf here and there in any store so we went for a uh, obviously to cover our costs, mm -hmm. you have to start deciding you're going to cover your costs and also decide where on the market you're going to fit and for us we weren't going to be middle of the range and we weren't going to be uh, just regular product, we were going to be at the high end. So a high end product for black women, which is quite unusual, you don't get many high end products for black women. I'm finding they're coming on more and more but it's, it's that end of the market that kind of is ignored. So that was how we looked at the pricing for it. It had to be something more than just normal because we spend a lot to make sure this product is the best. Your target market, black women, black women obviously, are they responding to that packaging, to that, you oh, know, yes. that specialness we, of it? Because I, 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 a lot of our products are actually gifts. So we started a whole range of, I mean, for Valentine's Day, we have um, a whole range of heart-shaped hampers and, and gifts to, uh, get people more interested in giving gifts because they are shiny and gold and it, it's a lovely gift to give to a woman to make them feel special about themselves you know uh, so yeah no they are responding in the beginning not so much but it's gotten a lot better that people now know we're here I, I've stopped going to places and people go who are you I've never heard of Aphrodite people tend to know who we are now they've actually heard of Aphrodite they've heard of Joliet and it, it's a nice feeling you know nice that the black community has embraced us uh, at the beginning, people were just like, I've never heard of your brand, you know, this is a new brand that's, you know, never graced our scenes, but it's it's more out there, we're getting in front of people with, the, you know, with your help and with the help of uh, all the fans that have come and told people about the products that they've used, so, yeah, no, they are how, how, how did you struggle, how, how are you struggling with, or did you struggle with your branding to stay with Afro, you know, like which one is going to come first? Is the Afro deity as a company or the brand, you know, the product as a brand? I think the brand will come first now. Uh, Afro deity was originally a blog and I think it's probably going to sink back into being just the blog, the kind of interaction between us and people. And Joliet will be more the, the, the brand that people will be more aware of. It is. It was quite difficult separating it at first because people had never heard of Joliet, but Aphrodite had won awards and people had heard of Aphrodite, but now we're trying to separate the two brands to make Joliet a bit more uh, all-encompassing so it's, you know, so that people can use it so that it's not just for one particular type of person. It makes it a bit more open and accessible to everyone. Tell me how social media has... What? Oh my goodness, Twitter is amazing. <laughs> Twitter, I mean, personally I have a Facebook account and that's about it. For my business we have Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Tumblr, everything going because it's, it's so important to interact with your fans and interact with the customers. I mean, people 
mostly Twitter, people have really interacted with us. And I know with Twitter, we've had the success of being uh, Thiepa Fetus SPS winners and Jacqueline Gold WOW winners. And I think that's how we actually found out about our EBR award was through Twitter. And with in terms of fans on Facebook, Facebook has been fantastic because uh, we were able to interact with people from Brazil, and we've now got a nice following in Brazil. You know, over 2,000 people from Brazil started following us in like one week because one girl, t you know, Facebooked about us. So fa social media has really helped us kind of explode onto a worldwide market. Uh, Twitter is more for the UK, but Facebook, I've known that we've seen people from the United Arab Emirates, from Brazil, from all over the world that have like started interacting with us there. Where can we buy your product? I've never heard of your product before. and. It's been a massive advertising campaign for us, just being on social media, pin interest as well. You know, some brands are starting to realize that, hey, we can get money if we sell to black people, but it's a, it's a lot, it's, it's taking its time. Like, I'd like to be able to go into a store and buy something out of boots. I'd like to see Joliet in boots or Selfridges or, you know, John Lewis. I'd like to walk yeah, in and see looking at, looking, like at your, looking at Joliet, if, if, um, if you, uh, if you as a black woman, you are not the one presenting the product to someone else, do you think anybody's going to have a problem with it? Or if you didn't, have, if you didn't, if you didn't write Afro-Caribbean on it, is anybody, anybody going to know that it's for black people? Um, when, when we ha I, on the side of it, it does say created by Aphrodite. And I know when we first started out, we were approached by one or two retailers who said they couldn't sell a product called Aphrodite which is kind of why we decided that maybe we should call it something else and Joliet became the name of the brand. But um, having Aphrodite as the brand, they weren't so keen on taking on something called Aphrodite because it had black in the title. You see? So th that's the point. So what, you know, do we need to re-identify ourselves? Is that a problem? Identifying our niche or something? That's where we end it today at the journey with Fancy. Thank you for listening and do tune in next time. Bye.